As much as it can be, yeah. We're working on our third set of substandard tools this evening. That's okay.
If you would all stand, please, you can start to listen to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, which stands for one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And if you would remain standing, please. Uh, I would really like to spend a moment of silence in memory of the two slain law enforcement individuals, Mike Jensen, Syracuse police officer, Michael Husak, Husak, sorry, the uh, Anadaka County Lieutenant Sheriff. Okay, you see, please. The United Lake Association uh, founded within their purview to make a monetary donation to both families of the deceased officers. And uh, there's a GoFundMe page, and there's no better do that for that. We thought that, that would be the least of it. As customary, we're going to start with a, uh, a short business meeting. And the first item on our business meeting is a report from our treasurer, Robert Walzak. Uh, if you come up here, give us an idea of what our funds look like. This Tony knows we're in pretty good shape. And the balance and the savings account is $39,788.19. And in the checking account, $5,696.09. If you're wondering where all that money came from, we got a healthy donation from Myers RV and Camping uh, Establishment that uh, really inflated our funds. And as a consequence of that, it enabled us to do more than we've ever done in the past. So we got uh, a scholarship fund that we uh, used to give to the serving students as well. So we're not so worried about our mailings that we need to do, our publications that we need to put out and send them. So uh, it's one of the first times in the history of this association, which by the way is 79 years old today. I think that deserves a lot of applause. I've been a part of this in 45 years, and uh, we've never had a fund like that to work with before, so it's quite tough. And thanks for the great job uh, managing our money. Association is nothing without you. So here comes the membership report from Bruce Shams, chair of our membership committee. Thank you, Tony. Last year we ended the year with 2,350 members, which is very good. Um, this year we did a live gather initiative for the membership layout. Kind of piggybacking off what Tony said with additional funds, we need to gain more members with the giving away membership groups, paid membership. So if you have some of those blue cards, fill them out for people that aren't already members and sign them in, we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. We like to see that number grow every year, and uh, it did grow from last year a bit. So let's hope that we can do the same this time around. So each and every one of you would just sign up with one extra person. That would really help me out. Know.
Time for our president's report. And our uh, current president is John Harmon, and he's got a few things he would like to address. Okay, good evening. Um, thanks, Tony, for putting together such a terrific program for tonight. And I'd like to thank the entire committee for their great work as well. We welcome back our many vendors, and we certainly welcome this great crowd here tonight. We saw that in the publication, yeah, we saw in the publications that Tony's, um, Tony's theme for the, for the night is more in 24, and it certainly proves that. Uh, this year, for example, one of our goals is to have more engagement with the problem of sedimentation in our lake. For example, the board has decided to support a stream bank stabilization project in collaboration with the local soil and water conservation district, which I'll display out here. This project will help reduce sedimentation from flowing into the lake, which is a very serious issue. We also look forward to DEC's new initiative to gather more data regarding the impact of numerous bass tournaments on our lake. That number has exploded in, in recent years. So we thank DEC Fisheries, Steve Hurst, for his work on this program. Of course, we also look for more members like you. You heard Tony, you heard Bruce talk about our membership. Try to get out there, sign up your neighbors and friends. It's not so much that we need the $8, but we need that club. So when we go to Albany, we have a big number uh, behind our name. That's very important. So we'd love to have more, uh, love to have more members. We'd also like to have more youth involved. Um, one, of the, one of the things we're proud of is, you know, when you start to introduce kids into, into fishing, they catch their first amount of lake fish, a very, a very exciting moment. Go to our website and download the certificate. You can fill in their names and their dates. It's very official. Uh, something cool that they can hang on their court board or on their wall or whatever. It's a good way for, for them to, and you to celebrate their first amount of lake fish. Another goal we've been working on is more lake access for both boaters and anglers. In addition to those, those items of more, we want to assure you that we also maintain our commitment to remain vigilant for any sign of poaching or other illegal activity on the lake. We're very firm about that. And we thank our law enforcement personnel for supporting us in this goal. I'm sure you'll hear more about that later tonight. All of these successes, both past and future, are the result of team efforts. Your board of directors is made up of highly talented folks who maintain a very high standard of excellence. And at this time, I'd like to invite all the board of directors to stand, please. Give a round of applause. We work very hard at putting a lot of hours to accomplish our goals. We'd also like to thank our friends from Cornell, from DEC, our, our supportive elected official, Brian Miller is here tonight. Brian, we're with Brian up front. Oh, thanks, Brian. Thanks, Brian. And we thank, certainly thank our, our law enforcement personnel, uh, those officers who are here working on tonight as well. And of course, I'll echo what Tony said, our members. We thank our members for, for coming out tonight. And finally, as I close out my term of office, I'd like to thank my wife, Sandy, for all the support she has given me throughout these past few years as president. Uh, another round of, of thanks goes to people who continue to support our mission through, uh, through monetary grants. For example, Togo US, we saw their, we saw their display out, out there. A grant from Togo US has donated four gift certificates, and we're going to be wrapping those off later tonight. Huge thank also to Marsha Kavanowski. She funds our, she's one of the funders of our uh, scholarship program, and she has an extremely generous donation this year uh, for a student to be chosen for the United Lake Association Scholarship in memory of her father, Eugene Kavanowski. So we thank Marsha for that as well. And finally, in conclusion, I'm very pleased to introduce your next president of the OLA, Matt Snyder. So, uh, I hope that Matt will stick around and give you a little extra support in the next book. Thank you very much for the time for the introduction. Um, I want to say hi to our presenters tonight, so I'll keep this super brief. Um, first of all, John, I, I've got enormous size for you to use the fill after your term is plural as president. And uh, the board could not have asked for a better leader at a better time than you. How about let's recognize John? Yeah.
quickly, I want to share with some of, uh, you know, the president's job is to necessarily um, dictate what happens with the association. Uh, it's not the job of the OLA president to say what the association is going to do. Um, the president's job is really to preside over the meetings and correspondence with elected officials and other stakeholders and make sure that the administrative processes of the United Lake Association happen smoothly, productively, efficiently, and get the things done for our lake that we need to get done. Um, in that vein, um, you know, we've heard about more, uh, more members, more funds, uh, more opportunities to make a difference for United Lake. Uh, one of the things that I want to challenge everybody who's here to tonight um, is for engagement with us. So quick question, who here um, knew the time and date of tonight's meeting that you saw on social media? Okay, that's okay. Um, who is here to write about in our poll? And who heard about this from a neighbor or a friend or fishing friends? Okay, so I, I think that um, makes the point that I'm trying to make here is that it's really members being engaged with the mission and the information and the literature about the United Lake Association that makes this thing tick. And during the years of COVID and after COVID, a lot of what people call the book and bullet organizations really kind of withered and died on the vine. Um, under John's leadership in particular, the United League Association has taken a, a different tack than that. Um, we're growing and we're stronger than ever, thanks to the efforts of you to sign up for people like you, your friends and neighbors who are passionate about the United League. Um, I want to challenge everybody here to think about engaging more with the United League Association. Um, we've got opportunities for people to volunteer at everything from highway cleanups to street bank stabilizations to vehicles. Uh, um, every single director who stood and was recognized earlier is a volunteer. A uh, directorship of the United Lake Association is a little different from volunteering for other OLA activities, but it started with that saying, hey, I, I know this association, I care about it, I care about this lake, I want to spend some extra time to get involved. Um, the qualifications are pretty simple. You need to have a lifelong love and passion for night lake and, and care for the people who use it and benefit from it. Uh, and you need to be willing to spend some of your time and energy and expertise to volunteer. Um, so please, if that inspires you in any way, go out to our literature, look at our website, uh, look at our bulletin, find one of the OLA directors who's a friend or neighbor or fishing buddy, uh, and reach out and see how you can get involved. Thank you. Oh, okay. I shall see the floor of that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Our, our last minute edition, not to be outshone, OLA Director Matt Shakers. So I just want to take a minute um, to announce that we're going to be starting a new fishing derby this year. We're going to kick it off on the Lincoln Walleye, and it's going to go the whole year all the way to the end of December. And it's going to be for use 15 and under. Uh, anyone that's a child or grandchild or somebody in OLA can participate. And we're going to have uh, six different categories. We're going to have a category for longest walleye, longest perch, longest smallmouth bass, longest largemouth bass, um, king pickerel. And then we're going to have just a general category for non game fish, so carp, catfish, whatever the longest fish in that group is a win. Um, so the only stipulation is the fish has to be caught in an eye lake instead of moving one bridge up to the first to pass the barrier. Uh, you simply need to submit a photo, um, one of the fish on the ruler, and then one of the fish with the child either holding it or the background. And for now, we're just going to have to send those photos to the United Lake uh, president. Um, at LightLakeAssociation.org. We're working on updating our uh, website. There'll be a form there. We'll be able to uh, upload the information and photos, but better um, that. That'll be coming in the near future. So keep an eye uh, on the newsletter. We'll be announcing that when it happens. But for now, just document what you get touched. And uh, you know, I challenge you all to take your kids out, get involved. You know, it's a, uh, I participated in a similar. Uh, Thirty miles of care really enjoy it, so uh, your kids and grandkids will enjoy it too. So, any questions? Um, let me know. I have some small handouts.
us and I put out up front. So feel free to grab one, um, give me a call if you have questions and spread the word. Thank you. Thank you. That's awesome news for me because it means for the rest of this coming year, I get to see a lot of fish pictures with kids. And, and I, I can't tell you how excited I am about that. So thank you. Um, Get more I need glasses. Um, thank you all for coming to the 79th annual members of the United Lake Association. Um, John and Tony, thank you, John, and both for hosting our members this evening. Uh, we now turn to the election of the United Lake Association directors. Um, to remind everybody, being on this board is a 100% volunteer position. Uh, our board members are all nominated from the ranks of the United Lake Association members in good standing. Um, this year, the OLA nominating committee has recommended to President Harvin and the board. Following OLA directors to nominate the Tony Bufa, Rick Colasani, Bob Cote, Bill Durbin, Matt Kazmierski, Greg Keener, and Bob Walson. Now, you'll notice that on that list, that's a slate of seven directors that were nominated. Uh, that should be eight, right? So we have an opening there. So again, people who care enough about the land to come to this meeting so might want to give some thought to whether they have expertise and skills that they can bring to this board. Uh, but we're moving tonight with uh, that list of seven. Again, Luther Colesine, Cody Durbin, Casper, Steve Kinger, and Paulson. Uh, this is a three year term. It expires on April 30, 2027. Uh, the slate was approved by the Annex vote of the Board of Directors, and our bylaws call for the election to now be held by a uh, show of hands before we spoke to the members present at this meeting. Um, I ask all the OLA members in attendance if you support the proposed slate of directors, please raise your hand and say aye. Aye. Thank you. Uh, by majority vote of the members present, the nominations are carried. Uh, the OLA board can now proceed to the Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Now, a lot of corporations that have representatives here should take notes on how to conduct a business. <laughs> Okay, get into the meat and potatoes part of the agenda. Uh, each and every year, the United Fish Club Administration, aka the Fish Hatchery, over in Constantia, does the walleye run and egg take. And the current manager, Bill Evans, current manager of that place, Bill Evans, um, had a challenging year. We needed some water in that lake before he could get his job done. And uh, he took some extreme measures to make sure we got the water we needed. And I'm sure he's going to tell you all about that. We're eager to hear a story, though. Big story. Well, thank you so much, Tony. And thank you all for being invited to be back. It's probably going to be to do that. So. Uh, yeah, so as Tony said, it's quite a weird year. It's actually just kind of important to emphasize that. Uh, this presentation is kind of front loaded with a lot of that. what happened even before the run this year. If it was just a, uh, one thing after another, it seemed like uh, that's a good slide. Some of these are very detailed. I'll tell you the last few slides. Apologize if you've seen these before, but a lot of the you know, basic information, like you can uh, show up the first time, I can see these. I want to make sure that's out there. Um, you know, one of the, the biggest points on this slide is uh, still, I just want to pitch that. You know, we're essentially located in New York State, but we don't just stop at Iowa Lake, we stop all over the state. We're essentially located in the states where other hatcheries come to us, take walleye fry, uh, lake sturgeon, or tiger muskies, whatever it is that we're raising, uh, and take them back to their the waters in their region. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please, real fast. And these are just some of the species we raise over the years. Obviously, walleye, lake sturgeon. We have a tiger muskie, we just raise cattle fish. Uh, we're probably going to have some. Straight muscular this year up to uh, four inches before they go down to South Hot Celic. We finished the pond and then we have brown whitefish and Cisco. Uh, so we have quite the diverse uh, ability at the United Fish Management Station. Uh, next slide, please. So before the hash is uh, actually fired out in the spring and we got water going through the building, uh, we noticed that the outflow to the hatchery was uh, pretty much covered with gravel. Uh, the picture to the left is a little trench. I was just standing on it before the actors look at the hatchery. It's a little trench there in the center of the street there, dug it out by hand with shovels. 
standing in the water. And the picture to the right, it's a little dark, you can't see very well, but up against the wall on the right side of that picture, about 18 inches below the surface is our exit pipe. So you have about a foot of gravel above the water, and the pipe is about 18 inches below the water. So that's how much gravel uh, was pushed into there. Uh, just you want to know why? Okay, let's go to the next slide. Uh, so if uh, any of you missed it last summer, we had quite the flood in the hatchery. Um, if you've ever been to the IED at the tree, uh, the last picture, that's the hatchery. Uh, during the flood, the creek used to break up to the back lawn. Uh, the picture to the right is our boat dock area where we used to step down onto a walkway and then we step down into the boats. Yes, those are the boats right at level with the doors. And the lower left picture shows water flowing through the building because the creek was so high. We just had um, the, a very centralized uh, thunderstorm, a lot of rain right in that watershed, and it all came down at once. And the, the lower right picture is there our overhead door facing Route 49 where the water's flowing out and flipping on the other side. We moved a lot of gravel, really moved stuff around the creek. It made it quite difficult to get it uh, opened up and running this, this spring. Next slide, please. Um, something other uh, also unprecedented was how early the fish were in the creek this year. I had people like first week of March. Uh, oh, there's fish here, there's fish there. We're catching white this one. Okay. All right. That's not Scott Creek, but okay. Um, and then we started hearing other fish in the creek the second week of March. All right. I see a few, but I don't really see a whole lot. Um, and then last week of the season, people were there like the Salmon River uh, catching walleye. Finally enough, our own Erica went out back behind the hatchery at lunchtime. I think we gave us a shot. It catches a walleye. And we've always said that um, you never see a walleye with 28 inches in the night of lake. That's what happened to 29 inches. Just everything is all this year. It's pretty bizarre. But uh, and she released it in case you're wondering. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and then this is our boat docking area in front of the hatchery. You walk from the lobby down the little ramp there to look out the window. And this is where we keep our boat. Uh, the left, lower left picture is. Generally, what you might see in January and February, they're drawing the lake down in preparation for snow melts, uh, having spring rains, uh, and they anticipate that water level up. So, it uh, didn't have a whole lot of snowpack this year. Uh, all the rain was predicted, never showed up. Um, so, that led us to, in the upper right picture, we're trying to set our nets, and we had to pull the boats out because we couldn't put the motors in the water because there really wasn't any water. Um, in the lower right uh, picture was when we had spare time. We're trying to run the crops without overheating the motor. Then we had a trash pump going. We were trying to get the sediment out into the creek channel itself. Um, it was quite the undertaking. Um, but luckily, we had folks from the batteries come and give us a hand with that. Next slide, please. And I wanted to give a shout out too quick. So I contacted New York Canal Corporation, Admiral Burkeville, and Joseph Maloney. Uh, when I had you know, concerns about the creek level, uh, they've always been really good at bringing it up. This year was just so early. They put me in contact with Scott. I can try to pronounce his name, Rebarzik. Rebarzik. Um, he's a senior hydrologist. Hydrologist is doing power authority. Uh, and he's uh, uh, one of the like, we think the levels is the correct height, or a great, great level for this time of the year. We don't like to let it go, go much to uh, bring it up too early because we could still get these rains. Uh, and then he looked at it a little further, and apparently there was some issue with the couple of pages on the lake to fix that up right away. And unfortunately, we didn't have any rainfall, so it took a few days for that water to come up. So we fought up and down the creek to get the boats down the creek and up the creek. Normally, we can pass two boats in the creek. We had one channel that we could put one boat down or one boat up. So if there was a boat coming out and a boat coming up, we one had to move the other pass before we get it back to the hatchery. Next slide, please. And then, of course, as most of you know, it was beautifully warm in early March. And Oh my gosh, that's 70 degrees. And that's, oh my God, and that's so beautiful. And then, of course, we said that's and then boom, it's rain. It's, I'm sorry, snow and ice. Uh, we had skim ice out there, had to break it up to get some to the nest in one day. Uh, so that's always fun. Next slide, please. And then, one other thing I was uh, wrestling with was our backup generator, the big polar diesel engine on the right hand side that powers the building if the power goes out, which usually does a few times this spring. We have heavy storms. Uh, the power is the entire building, so the backup uh, uh, drum filter that filters the water, shuts off, becomes plugged, and then there's no water going to the fish and the eggs. That's a big problem. So we uh, got a standby unit from Edmar there, uh, so we can send that over down to Syracuse to do repair. 
Um, and that's all manual is R1 out, and that's one out there that keys or we'll engine up, we'll transfer switch, luckily we had um, a very capable uh, electrician, a lot of assets come in and wire that in for us. Fantastic guy, uh, always there for the hatchery, very, very reliable. Um, and uh, luckily we haven't had to use it yet. So, and we did just get the, the engine back, so it should be going in this week. And then also 4L, I think we'll talk about the transmitters later. They had to do surgery and sort of the transmitter uh, for their uh, telemetry survey on the lake. So they needed to place kind of quarantine off uh, from everybody else where they could do the surgeries and implant those. And we just kind of set up a little makeshift surgery center, as they call it there. Uh, very high end and our great tarps and uh, yeah. Working on a budget, but it works. I mean, it's appreciative, appreciative of that. Um, of course, we have the signs. We saw Alex Allen out there up front. Very, very nice signs there. A lot of the public really are supposed to come on. Very informative. It worked out very well. Next slide, please. And I always like to uh, throw up in the last few years the numbers. This year, I decided to uh, hold the dates the nets are set uh, because we do seem to be seeing a trend where the nets are being set earlier. But you're allowed to talk about climate change and the warming and that. So, you know, that only stands to reason that the wall area starts spawning a little earlier. Um, so, we're going to have talks with a uh, lot of canal formation. We're not going to have snow melt during the early spring rains and the wall are coming early. Uh, let's see if we can talk to them or maybe bring the level, the lake level up a little earlier than normal from here on out. I don't know how that's going to go. I'm not part of that talk, but uh, push that up the chain. So, some numbers there, uh, nothing really out of the ordinary this year. Uh, Our market will be capped for the Cornell does, that's next year. That's the next year, be a really big number of fish to take. Uh, we really only needed 242 million eggs this year, but because of the um, backup generator issue that I was a little concerned about, uh, I wanted to hit our last uh, 20 million eggs. So we did reach our goal this year for 262 million eggs. Um, they're doing great to catch you right now. We currently had 10 trips up so far on that lake. Few other areas uh, come to us and stock different waters. Um, but the net sets was really interesting. So we set seven nets. The lake was so shallow. You literally jump off the boat into the water at one point and reset a net anchor, which you never could have done in the past. Um, without, again, I've said this in the past, without that draw from the creek, without the flow going out into the lake, it doesn't give the fish the signal to come off the creek. So they don't come into that area that's heavy. So we set a couple extra nets a couple days later. And then that and that's still more fish in the way. So we set a few more nets even later than that. But then we had a couple of days of uh, predicted south winds, which if anybody remembers some years back, uh, could really good damage has some fish in the nets. Uh, so we had a couple of days where we actually went out and pulled the spreader bars, collapsed all the nets. They didn't fish for a full day. Um, and we decided to pull one of the nets that day, so we had 10 nets. But again, the bottom numbers, the date set two years ago, we set up the 29th of March. Last year, we set up the 3rd of April. This year, we set up the 28th of March. Next slide, please. Yes, sir. I see you got more eggs out of less fish, but on the average size, bigger, is that what it is? Just more quarter? Uh, well, that's, yeah, so it, that could be a multiple of things. Uh, you'd ask you about the number of eggs per fish. I actually have a slide a little further on about that, but I'll just touch on it quick here. Um, the yes, it could be uh, based on what they're pouring out there, how well the fish are eating, and the overall general health of the fish. This year, I think, because we got them fairly early and the water was cold, the fish tend to hold their eggs better because the water rolls up and they're more, they're right, more right when it express their eggs. So every time you handle that fish, it's dropping some eggs. So later in the, the run, you generally see that number drop off because they're dropping some eggs every time we handle them. So I, I can't comment specifically on saying yes, that's what it is. But um, it does look like they may, may, may have been feeding a little better. Um, but I'm guessing that it's more due to the temperature in the early tide. Um, so, is that that play? That's a little video there. Yeah, so this was the day after the rough winds were out there resetting the nets. This was uh, John DiVirgilio and, and uh, Josh Bryant, a couple of our employees there, resetting the nets after the rough wind. And you see the bob, the whole bobbing. That's kind of typical of that lake for us. There. Next slide. And then, of course, the fish sorting, if you've never been to the hatchery, we handle every single fish that comes in. Fish that weren't processed, uh, female fish that were processed one day have to be rechecked the next day. 
Next slide. And this is the steering station. Uh, two to one, two males and a female, fixed in the bowl. Next slide, please. And like last year, we saw a lot of nice fish, healthy fish, but nothing really big, nothing worth really measuring. Uh, we hear some who's an odds at one point. I mentioned that one, it was a 26 inch wall, like this fish. Um, oh, actually, we expected to jump. So, yeah, I can't tell what 24. So, but from what we see, uh, it's definitely nothing really giant. Uh, next slide. And then the egg treatment, the eggs go down, they get water hardly treated with uh, tannic acid, which is just a layer. Then they water hardly in uh, iodine. Um, and again, it's the same thing this year, I mentioned this last year. Uh, when the eggs water hardly actually absorb the iodine in the water and become hard and weedy, uh, and the boys stir those eggs by hand, you can feel that process happening for some reason. Yes, it's chemistry involved in the water. Uh, so water hard after an hour, so it helps sit a little longer to do that. Next slide, please. And here's the eggs for female slides over the years. Uh, part of this one moved more recently, it's part of this one right now. Uh, 63,000, 27, I think, for female is the average this year. Pretty decent number. Um, I think it's only maybe about a dollar each. Uh, it's just a fish later. I don't know about that. Next slide, please. Then the egg incubation, if you've been in the hatch, you see egg batteries. And I always like to talk about, you know, every single jar has a valve. Um, this year we had 586 jars, so every single one has its own valve. That's totally controlled, but this isn't uh, your household pressure, 80 BSI, constant pressure, this is head pressure. So whatever level that water is in with a drum filter, related to the water level of the pond, you know, the one wall has less pressure, so it affects everything downstream. So anytime you adjust one of these valves, whatever's in that head box, that lowers that adjust that affects that. But these valves get plugged up because it's, uh, you know, it's an organic water source. It's free. Yes, it's filtered, so it's filtered down to a certain time, a certain uh, size, very microns if you're interested. And you have all these fines and particulates in there that eventually build up and break through, so you can plug it up. Um, it's kind of dark. But the picture on the left shows the different varied levels of the, the eggs. When we put them in there, same number of eggs in the jars, uh, same flow. We try to get them right up even, so it's not easy to see you know, if there is an issue in those jars. But it's just a constant uh, issue caring for those eggs. And then fry stocking, uh, average 21 days, and we had eggs hatched already, so it's in there uh, day 28 when they started. Um, and we're stocking, as I mentioned, we've had 10 trips on like a, a night lake with our pontoon boat already, and a few trucks go in and take fish away. Next slide. And then the lake sturgeon, we'll do that again this year. Um, good news, the sturgeon numbers are coming up, which is great. Um, just saw some released in a predator uh, fish and wildlife service, but then that's endangered species list, which is awesome. Um, and those are the numbers for us this year again. Next slide. And then the Cisco, which we have had the last few years, they finally they built a uh, building at Bat Hatchery. Um, so we won't, we didn't have any of those this year. We'll have it you know, going forward. Next slide, please. In case you don't know, DC has a uh, alert news bulletin that DC delivers. If you look that up, you can subscribe to it. You get all this really neat information that's happening within the DC. Uh, and this is just talking about the building. Go ahead, next slide. And then, of course, the Target Muskie program continue to do that. 100,000 prior monthly from Pennsylvania, uh, Pleasant Mount Hatchery. Um, we're trying to go 100,000 packages. Next slide, please. And we're still working on the tiger trees, if uh, if any of you are familiar with that, something we did in-house, just a piece of cover to kind of uh, soothe and relax the fish. And uh, we've seen some promising results, but in the end, it doesn't really seem to make a lot of difference. It gets about four inches, and uh, those that were smaller and the entire tree tank catches up, it's still really good. Make any kind of promises, I guess. Next slide, please. And then, so these are the species we're raising this year in the hatchery, walleye, 205 million fry, tiger muskie, 7,000, this year 4,000, and then the muskie will be 7,000 for which we raise up uh, for the South Outside Sierra Pond. And then, of course, you can go to the YDC or whatever you go, and you see that, why not go? And the YouTube page has a lot of really good videos. There's a walleye run, there's a walleye egg tank video on there. That was really neat. They had a lot of different videos. And then, next slide, the final one. And, uh, any questions? Only a couple questions. If anybody has any questions, just uh, right over here. How many walleyes did they put transmitted? So how many transmitted eggs or walleyes? Two hundred, correct, Kelly? Two hundred. Yeah. 
Thanks, Tony, and good evening, everyone. Uh, before I get started, I'd uh, like to acknowledge Kristen Hawk and Chris Otelling. They collect and process all our immunology samples. And Tom working in Canada is soon to conduct the fishery survey. So a lot of what you're going to hear tonight is a result of their efforts. So tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about immunology. We haven't done that in a few years, so I thought it was high time to bring it up to speed. Um, and I'm going to talk about the fish species of interest, a little bit about angler data, and then finish up to, with an update of the telemetry project that I introduced to all of you last year. Uh, the lake is getting warmer. You probably all have heard about climate change. Well, we're seeing it now in Niagara Lake. Um, the Lunology program was started by Europe, Mills in 1975. And since 1975, the water temperature is warm significant, significant. Uh, we have our uh, temperature really off the plane collects water temperatures every hour year round. 
Uh, it's forming at the pace of almost one degree Fahrenheit every 10 years. Um, doesn't sound like much, but that is certainly fairly significant for a fish that spends its whole life in the water. Uh, what's a little bit more alarming to me is it makes sense the water's warming. We're losing ice coverage. I don't think that so many of you have thought that based on the past two years of the ice fishing season. Um, but if you think back to 1975, the ice fishing season was about three months long and we've lost one third of that. So uh, if that trend continues, uh, you might be down to uh, ice coverage in about one month. And, Fifty years. Um, maybe we won't be concerned about that. But kids and so our grandkids might be concerned about that. Not only is the lake warming, but it's getting clearer. Um, we measure water clarity in second depth, and since 1975, that also has increased significantly. This plot's a little bit misleading, though, because the, the what's driving the water clarity is the change from not having as many muscles and water muscles to when we do it as even most as provided. When they became established and their numbers reached the level they're at, uh, the water clarity has not changed since um, uh, the mid-1990s. So that change was driven by uh, the, the earlier years and then into the zero years. For fillet, that's a measure of the amount of algae in the water that has decreased significantly um, since 1975. And uh, that's a concern because that's the bottom of the food chain. Or delay is it, it tells you about how much algae is in the water. The zooplankton eats the algae, the small fish eat the zooplankton, and the big, big fish eat the small fish. Um, the good thing though, is that the zooplankton densities have not changed. So even though chlorophyll, chlorophyll has decreased over time, uh, uh, so plain and then so you said there's been enough for them to maintain their numbers. We show you this picture every year, we just updated with the New Year's Day. It's the adult walleye population in the lake. You all remember the 2019, 2020, 2021 populations were real high relative to the past. Um, right now, we, the past couple of years, we've gone down to uh, about the, the normal population level, which is about 600,000 adults. We forecast the next couple of years of the population based on the age one and two catches, and we expect that the young fish being added to the population is going to uh, kind of account for the, the fish that are removed. So the adult population should maintain itself at around 550 to 600,000 fish uh, this year and next year. Last year, I knew you were aware of the 2002 year class. Um, I warned you that it was a little early to get all hyped up about that, but there were a lot of them that were big in the fall of their first year. Last year, we got a look at them as age ones, and they have maintained their high level of abundance. Um, I won't be able to get a, a solid number on what we expect them to contribute until after this year at age two. Like I said, our predictions are based on age one and age two, but uh, we're pretty optimistic that those adult numbers are going to be above uh, the 600,000 in 2026. How far above that line? Well, we don't know. The blue line is the average long term population. Yellow perch are doing great. Um, Tony can attest to that. He's been, been fishing. Not only are there a lot of them, but they're big. We attribute this increase to both mayflies and gophers. Very critical part for a year class of yellow perch is the first few weeks of life. That's when a lot of them, like 99% of them, will be consumed. With the presence of mayflies, fish that would normally be eating yellow perch eat mayflies. So the more the younger, the younger yellow perch are surviving until later in life. And after those fish are done feeding on mayflies, a lot of them are feeding on gophers, so their higher survival is continuing. We attribute the, the recent high numbers of adults, at least in part, to the mayflies and gophers. Smallmouth bass is probably the, the worst aspect of what I have to tell you tonight. Uh, their adult numbers have been sliding for the past, well, at least five or six years, maybe more, depending on where you decide the decrease has started. Um, and what's even more discouraging is we have no indication of strong year class in the past five or six years. So we expect 
this uh, decrease in the double bond as well. So overall, the numbers that, that were observed before the mid-1980s, it's definitely going down from uh, the late 90s early 2000s. White perch are also just decreasing. Uh, we haven't heard many concerns over that. Um, some people like to fish for them, but they are major player in the lake. They're either the second or third most most amount of fish in gill nets, and they do feed on fish, so it's important for us to keep tabs on those. Uh, but their numbers are decreasing as well. Everybody loves the lake sturgeon. A lot of questions on lake sturgeon. Uh, the big news there is we've documented natural reproduction in the past 11 years. So the DEC is continuing to stock 500 per year, but that's getting augmented by natural reproduction. So those numbers are just going to continue to go up, and their growth rates remain very high. Brown Goby, they uh, were first identified by anglers. They saw them in uh, Yellow Perch Summit. 2013, we started catching them in our year in 2014. By 2016, they were the most abundant species of trawls in any dive. Since that time, uh, they've been increasing every year in abundance. Not yet. Not yet, sorry. <laughs> our abundance, goatees are really tough to evaluate uh, in terms of their numbers. And our abundance is uh, as high or higher than any, any of the other published abundances in New York State. I mean, there are only a few. Um, we have pretty high growth densities. We don't know where that's going to cut off. Uh, that just remains to be seen and we'll continue to monitor them. They're an important prey item for yellow perch, red perch, bass, and walleye. So they're playing pretty uh, significant role. Bay flies, uh, I think they're really the, the dark horse in all this. They're, I'm sure everyone's noticed that their numbers are just. Astronomical in the early summer, and the fish are definitely taking advantage of them. We've shown that age zero smallmouth bass growth rates have increased with lake flies globally, but certainly yellow perch and white perch growth rates have increased as well. Haven't seen that same increase in the walleyes, but they're a little bit more dependent on fish. Um, every year, I don't know what to expect, but it's been pretty consistent. Large catches and that, so I think it needs to happen again this year. Just a couple slides about uh, angler catch rates. For walleye, uh, the, the state walleye management plan says angler, the target angler catch rate of 0.25 to 0.5 is at very good to excellent. Year in and year out, we're around, right around 0.5 on the right way. Some years it's a little lower, and some years it's considerably higher. Um, that's determined by two things. Obviously, the number of walleye in the lake determines it, but also the prey fish abundance. If there's a lot of prey, angler catch rates increase. But they, there hasn't been a lot of prey in recent years, so their catch rates have been fairly high. Uh, despite the decrease in smallmouth bass adult numbers, their catch rates are still fairly high as well. That's just a matter of fishermen know what they're doing. If there's fewer fish, they're still going to the best spots, and the anglers know where those spots are. So. We have not seen a decrease in uh, targeted catch rates for smallmouth bass. Open water walleye harvest. Um, 2002, you can see, it was a lot higher than in previous years, uh, over 100,000 fish. And it's a little bit peculiar that that coincided with the value of increasing from three to five fish. But that is not the reason for the highest higher harvest. We do conduct real surveys. And in 2022, we estimated that about 10% of the total harvest was a result of that increase. The total harvest was high just because the angler catch rates were high and the harvest rates were high. Um, a lot of times they aren't, they aren't in agreement because uh, if there's a lot of small fish, like this past in 2023, if there's a lot of small fish in the catch, you have to release them so you can have a high catch rate, but low harvest rate. In 2022, the harvest rate was high. Now we're back to more normal circumstances in 2023, um, probably because of that 2022 year class. There are a lot of small fish out there, and I watch a lot of anglers who are catching them as well. And that affects us. Um, not much I can say about the winter fishing other than the ducks really work for For two years in a row, they were the shortest ice seasons that we documented at the point, and uh, we can only assume that. The harvest in the ice is low. 
And that also is contributing to the high perch numbers of they're not being harvested in the winter, they're surviving for the next year, you know, above the summer. Uh, I'd like to just finish up with the update of the telemetry project. I introduced that last year. Next slide, please. Just to remind you that the objectives are to get a more comprehensive understanding of where walleye spawn. We know they spawn at Fish Creek, Chenango Creek, um, Dutchman Island, uh, Scarlet Creek, obviously, but we don't know, we don't have a documented other spawning areas, and we're pretty sure there are some of those. Uh, we want to get a better understanding so fine scale movements throughout the year. And then uh, for market capture reasons, we want to get a better handle on the distribution of the walleye. Um, after we mark them with an action. For the telemetry study, you need three things. You need fish, got plenty of those. Uh, you need transmitters that get inserted inside the fish, and they send out a signal every four minutes. And you need receivers that listen to those signals. And those receiver signals, um, they don't pick fish up when they're in range, which is the level one kilometer based on the tags that we're using. Um, we're going to have our first data download from those receivers this July. It's going to be an astronomical amount of data, so it's going to take a little bit a little while to uh, analyze, but I'll tell you how, how we're going to take that and get an advantage of that we'll talk about in just a minute. So we deployed 64 receivers. Uh, the black thing on the top of that arrangement are the receivers and the floats. Um, help us retrieve those receivers every year and then the uh, tune to the weights keep those on bottom for the duration of the season. Next slide, please. We have this is our receiver grid, and because of the range of the tags and the distance between receivers, there's not going to be a lot of places on the way where a fish can go and be undetected. We have uh, 63 in the lake proper and five in some of the small tributaries, or six of the small tributaries. As Bill mentioned, we tagged 200 fish. We obviously tagged the inserted transmitters of 200 fish. We inserted um, 100 last fall. We went around the lake, eight different areas of the lake, and electric shot fish, and inserted transmitters of those fish, hopefully representing the whole lake population. And then this spring, we inserted transmitters in 100 adults process at the hatchery, 50 males and 50 females. And um, they, like I said, the transmitters sent out in every four minutes. And the battery life is three years. So we'll be able to track these fish for three years unless they die or are harvested or otherwise move the lake. If they leave the lake, we'll know. And if they come back to the lake, we'll know that as well. Um, and this is where you new folks come into play. As of March, we received eight transmitters back from anchors to harvest the fish. Um, the fact that they harvested is great. Harvesting these fish is great. This is information we want to know. But we do want the tags back. And uh, contact information, there's a sticker with that information on every tag. The font's really small, so if you're like me, you're going to have to get the great kids to get it to you. Um, but please, if uh, Keep an eye out for fishing you fillet for a tag, and if you find them, please contact us and we'll make arrangements to get them all. We have these signs up at all the launches, uh, go back from some part, all the launches and access points. So um, if you if you do get a tag and you really can't make it out on, on the tag, you can visit these signs and uh, know who to contact you. So, as I mentioned last year, we're part of the GLaDOS network. It's Great Lakes Acoustic Telemetry Observation System. Um, those different colored dots are all receivers throughout the Great Lakes and different projects that are going on. But the take home from this slide is that we're part of an organization that's been doing this a long time, so they have a lot of expertise. And they've developed the software that's going to be able, that's going to make it us be able to handle a huge amount of data. So, uh, we're going to get the biggest bang for our buck and um, start realizing that hopefully this fall when we start analyzing the first year's data. Next slide, please. Um, I just visited their website uh, just the other day, and you can see that Oneida Lake has many good websites, so we've made a big down far right corner. Um, next slide, please. 
So that's all I have for tonight, and I'll try to answer any questions you might have. It does not. Uh, they, they, they increased once the wheat growth increased, like the small ones did, but they haven't had the same decline as small ones. So they're, they're pretty low. It varies to be new, but pretty much long term trends. Uh, yeah, Yeah, we we got a sample young respond for four different year and all four years have the same thing. There's just no and the timing is consistent with what I think it is, but I don't ask less predators and a lot of predators. So it's circumstantial at this point, but it's it's going to happen. Yeah. We haven't seen a white bass here in, in decades. They were here for a short time. They provided fishery. Uh, nobody really knows why they arrived. They don't know what that's going to be done for us. Uh, really, a good species. I'd love to see them back, but it's going to be years since we see them. Yep. The average size fish you uh, put those transmitters in. There are eye cup, which is the animal care protocol or now. Requires a fish to be requires the, the, the transmitter to weigh two percent or less of that fish. So we know the weights of the transmitters, and we know the weights of the right of the fish. The smallest fish we can put in is 16 inches. I don't know what the average one is. It's probably about 19 inches. Someone did ask about the gizzard shed dying off earlier. Um, we don't have any concrete evidence of why they died off. We did send samples. To the vet school and they came back negative for pathogens. That doesn't mean a pathogen didn't cause the die-off, but it, uh, it would have been helpful if they had some positive hits. They did not, so um, you can't point the finger for sure of pathogens. And there was also um, there's also evidence of um, spawning stress related to temperature fluctuations. So if you remember when that die-off occurred, we had a big warm up and a big cool down. During their spawning season, which is just going off in that kind of thing, we don't know for sure. We'll keep an eye on it again. So. That's the only adult visit shed that I'm aware of since I was here. Yeah. Any guesstimate on the uh, number of sturgeon in the lake right now? The number of adult sturgeon we estimated was over 400, but those are really old fish. They've been around a long time. We don't have an estimate of the site that's at this point. Their survival is high, so 500 a year for the past uh, 15 years. There's at least that many, I think, except for the fish that we exist in. In the back? How big is the uh, incision on the walleye? So is this something we can basically see when we're out of water? Well, if we're good, we won't be able to see it in a year or so, but it's about a half inch to three quarters of an inch. It has two sutures in it. Uh, they did not heal well over the winter, which is not a surprise because it's so cold. Um, the fish that we observed this spring at the hatchery, I think there were 11 of six fish from last fall that we recaptured. The incision was healed, and the sutures were still in place. Frank? I have a related question to that. Do you have a We do not. We did that on purpose. Um, when we were designing the study, I was getting indication from anglers that people say, well, if I catch one of those fish, I'll let them go. We don't want them to do that. We want to have an independent estimate of exploitation or harvest. So we purposely did not do that. Some studies do that. We do not. I don't know if it's that high. I haven't done much time. Like 15 to 24. So yeah, that's, how high can it go and what impact will that have long term? We don't know. Um, the feed on mussels with that lot of mussels. Um, Chris Canuto on the Buffalo said it takes about nine years for gobies to reach 
some level of equilibrium since we have a lab from what we've seen and might have reset the clock. So uh, we're, we're getting there, we're not there yet. That remains a little tricky. This is going to be the last question. We got to roll this program going. And if you have a limit of five walleyes, now you're down to 500,000. Is there a limit to go back down to three? That's up to the state. Um, I can't answer that. We could provide them with the data they provide the answer. Thank you. One more question. Thank you very much. Oh, come on. You can ask Tony how to go out. Tony, great presentation. Thank you. Law enforcement is something that's necessary and appropriate, and uh, we have Mark Colasanti, a lieutenant with the New York State DEC, to make the presentation this evening. If the name sounds familiar, his dad, Rick Colasanti, has been very instrumental in why you have the current hatchery over in Constantia. Rick spent the better part of 40 years in that hatchery. The last 10 years of his tenure there, he supervised six other or seven other hatcheries at the same time. If you like the design of the new hatchery, it's something that he created himself. And the special dry food that is now part and parcel of how walleyes are raised from birth, that's another accomplishment that Rip Kalasanti has. So his son, Mike Kalasanti, is a conservation officer and he's going to take care of the law enforcement presentation this evening. But a round of applause for Rip for. <laughs> What he said was accurate. <laughs> and he's been a board member forever and uh, a great past president for this association. Thanks a lot, Bill. Okay, Mark, it's all yours. Thanks, Tony. Um, also got Matt Foster here. Uh, together, Matt and I supervise uh, the South Shore Medley. So, Matt, um, Came to the a couple years ago. Uh, so I cover I cover Onondaga and Eaton County. Matt covers Corp and Shane and Madison. Um, so like Bill was saying, this is an odd year for us too. Um, with the weather, things getting warm so quickly. Uh, fish were running early, people were out in full force. We had a fortunate circumstance where we happened to be out there at the same time. Good for the walleyes. Um, I was working the day before the walleye season closed, and I've been doing this a while. I haven't seen anything like it. People were catching, like, like Bill said, the shoulder to shoulder of the Santa River. They were catching limits of walleye in a half an hour. But uh, I worked that entire day into the into the nighttime. And never, we never had one violation. So we never saw anybody taking over the Part of that is because we, you know, we were out there so much. We had details going on throughout the entire month of, of March and in halfway through April to make sure that um, everybody was behaving with that early run. Um, yeah, violations were very low on the detail this year. We've been doing these details on the South Shore for probably what, five years now? Four years, probably about four or five years. And when we first started, we're talking high numbers of uh, people fishing in the cold waters. Uh, you know, maybe 60, 70 tickets the first year. Next year, at that, next year, Last couple of years, hardly any. So people are getting the message that we're out there looking. Um, uh, the guys in Cornell have had a great help. We kind of set up with that, that as our kind of our little hub there. Uh, they let us keep the boat in the water during that early time period. It was great. 
Uh, we also, we're not just on the trips, we're also getting out there on the, uh, on the water. And we did make some early on some good cases of people taking walleyes out on the lake during the uh, boat season. So, um, as far as uh, what to expect the rest of the year, it's going to be business as usual. Um, for us, I know we got details planned for the opener. It's now the turkey opener as well, so we kind of have to split our time on that day. But um, we're going to be out there then. And we're planning on being out there for the, uh, the remainder of the voting season. Matt, you can get that uh, another thing I just want to add, everybody hear me about the mic pump, um, is that uh, we did add a new boat to our uh, to our inventory this year uh, coming up. So we'll be, we have a new well that'll be out there. It's a little bigger vessel that we can allow us to be on the water a little more, uh, especially when it gets choppy out there than it usually does. So uh, that's kind of added on to help stop our controls. Uh, and like uh, Lieutenant Corsani said, uh, you know, I used to work in Sioux County, and I know that we ran a lot of those details up there, and kind of bringing it down to the South Shore. You know, definitely we're out there, and our guys are out there. So, yeah, good to see you guys. Good to see you too, guys. Thank you. Any questions? No, I, I didn't call Rick to share. Do you guys do any night patrols uh, at all? Because we had an issue on the pier uh, last fall. We had people taking more of the, the trunk and coming back. I saw the rip up about it. Chatham Park? No, right on the pier, the Silver Beach. Oh, oh Silver yeah. Beach? Yeah. So so we do. So I know, you know, for a fact, uh, our, our details that we run uh, are in the nighttime and the early morning hours a lot of times. Um, with that specific location, that's actually region six. Uh, so if the team, if the, if the complaint was made, that would go through their dispatch. So I can't, I can't comment on that uh but we definitely the biggest thing that you guys would be your eyes out there is if you do see it certainly you know license plates are big um and any type of information that you can get for us and then and then just make a call um and then and try to get and we can try to get somebody out there for us well i did i did call the stand and i talked to you about that yeah we we i know we don't work there we're six but I, we know people that work there we can pass the message along but you should call them the i know that they're working i know this year they had they had the same issue. There was a lot of fish getting caught there this year. Um, you know, when the season was open, but again, same thing. But hearing from them, that people were behaving pretty well and not keeping over the limits. Yeah, he, uh, a lot of people get a lot of calls in or emails and stuff. You know, we try to help all you want to And I don't know why they call us instead of me. So what they do a lot, right? A lot of complaints also was that down in the six area or else on Chapel Park. What about the refugees? How about educating them? You know, it seems like they're a big part of the people not following the regulations of refugees. We, we, they do a lot of details. Like Chapel Park, for example, we both supervised that area in the last. In the last few years, we've done plain clothes details there, and we've been there fishing right near, right next to these people. And no matter what, we we're not seeing it. We're not seeing a ton of violations. And, it, and of course, you have to you have to you have to hit it just right. Lots of times, it has to be the right night for us to make good cases. But regardless of who's fishing on the pier, we haven't seen a lot of violations there. Uh, but the details we brought. Yeah. Uh, but again, it, we are uh, not out there every day. Yeah, just the thing, uh, they had one down in the Utica Refugee Center that the whole boat started there. And they had, they had training and stuff. And they brought a lot of books in and stuff. And, you know, so it was pretty good. They had a good turnout. We had good bursters. You know, they had a lot of people in there. But the, the thing is, if those people from Old Caesar point the finger, okay, they're, they're taking too many fish here or whatever. But what are we doing when they come over to this country? Is we should have something better in place to educate them. I agree. And, you we, know, I think, it, 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 I think it's, I don't know, it's not easy with something, you know what I'm saying? Just, but, the, you know, then you try to tell some of the, some of the people that, because they want you, oh, I got to go rest. Gotta, you know, they may not be the exact answer. 
I know from personal experience being down there and checking, checking with individuals that don't know the regulations, um, we usually carry, uh, you know, the book, the, the magazine in, in our in our trucks. I've given that out to numerous people that haven't known. Uh, and, and we do try to use our discretion, obviously, you know, when, when we encounter those types of individuals to, to try to do education first and enforcement after them. But that's uh, something that we're definitely doing in the field. Uh, but I definitely, you know, think that we can maybe provide uh, the regulation books to maybe some of those centers so that they get them or, or something like that. You know, a lot of people don't realize that a lot of what we do is we do a lot of public outreach. Our officers, we do as well. We would be more than willing to, to do that. You guys should always bring it up. You're here. Thank you very much, Martin, man. Good job. Good job. Good job. Derek Glantz is the director of uh, Region 7, New York State DEC office, and uh, she's going to present some information about lake access, which seems to be shrinking and shrinking over time. Um, so I do want to set the back up on our open space plan 
that's coming out um, that you guys have an opportunity to provide comments on. And I think it's really important to state's 10 year plan um, uh, that identifies the key parcels um, and not specific like, you know, this tax parcel, um, but these are the areas that we would like to um, be able to purchase the state or other, we want to have conservation organizations or other um, land trusts be able to acquire those lands so that we can help protect source water, we can help protect uh, wetland complexes, habitat, critical um, habitat connectivity um, for fish passages and connecting with flood plants um, and working with nature as opposed to um, against her. And so I really encourage uh, when you see that open space plan, Region 7, um, all the regions have what's called a um, to wrap our regional advisory committee, so formed with a lot of different people um, that represent each of the counties in our region. We each have our own um, uh, plan. It'll come together. There's a larger statewide plan, um, and then we'll get down pretty narrow to um, to where we are in the region. And we this is a 10-year plan. We're able to use GIS, but we've stored now the interactive um, and it's going to be really helpful and a great tool. Um, our region is really amazing, right? So um, 20 years ago, we were concerned about sprawl. All of these laws were kind of built into uh, wastewater infrastructure funding. Um, we had to make sure that we weren't doing um, uh, sprawl without growth. And now we are facing one of the largest uh, pressures and growth in our local community. So the Department of State is actually doing a study right now looking at where are the key places that we need to protect and where are the key places where we want to drive um, development and where we want to put the people. So as you think about the area around Oneida Lake, you are the best stewards and advocates and use your voice um, to make sure that we keep those special places special. And one really, really important thing is coming up um, a wetlands regulations. As you guys know, wetlands are absolutely critical to um, making sure that we have nurseries um, for new fish, that we have habitat, um, that we're filtering out that sedimentation, that um, we're able to slow that water down um, and provide those critical pieces. Um, another piece that's really important too is to have some vernal pools and vernal ponds. These are ponds that are ephemeral. Um, they are infected. There's some fish there. Um, there's maybe amphibians and other things that are necessarily eaten by fish. Um, and so the new wetlands law in New York State becomes effective January 1, 2025. And so you'll see a comment period coming out uh, later this spring. Um, and I encourage you all to participate and to also help educate town boards, your planning boards, anybody else what, um, what's in here. And I'm very hopeful that this is going to clear up a lot of confusion. So the law that we're currently working under, um, New York State regulates wetlands that are 12.4 acres or larger because we're going to go metric in the 70s. And everything is based on hand-drawn maps from the 70s. So 1975. So things have changed a bit. Um, and uh, this will move forward with clear um, criteria of what a wetland is. Um, we'll be using remote or desktop analysis. If there's a disagreement, there's on site litigation um, to decide whether or not that's a, a wetland or not. There's also a, a clear um, appeals process. So it's not like this could just be a thing that never gets dealt with. Um, which I think is very, very important. Um, so I really encourage you to take a look at the wetlands um, law when it comes with wetlands regulation when it comes out um, so you can recognize um, what we, if it has all the things you want to have in there. Um, there's There was this language in, in our law uh, that said a mental importance, and it wasn't defined. Um, so it meant a lot of different things. So in this version, there's 11 criteria spelled out in the law, and one of the key ones is of, of local importance. And so that's if your community thinks that this is a very important wetland, um, if you protect it as a critical environmental area, area that's an official designation that your town, village, local government can do, you can already submit that to the BEC, and then it can be protected. So um, if that's something that you're interested in. Um, and uh, so just please take a look at that, share that with your members. I think it's going to be really important. The climate change conversation is critical. Um, we have to talk about ice fishing access, which my mentioned was flood ice. Um, this was a really, really tough year. 
And um, I think the board report was fantastic. So, I mean, um, on uh, so anyway, I can steal some stuff, steal a couple more things because it was really great. Um, but I think since 1975, you know, while I'm saying every 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 decade you get a, another degree, but four degrees Fahrenheit since 1975. So that's my lifetime. That's absolutely incredible and changes the way that fish behave. Like <laughs> when when water freezes, when it doesn't freeze. Um, you know, we are seeing we saw 13 days of ice cover in 2022 to 2023. Um, that's not what we've seen in the past. It's pretty significant. And then also, in addition to just kind of losing um, that access to that open space, that outdoor recreation, you're also going to see um, thermal stratification as you get lower uh, oxygen, uh, as you get oxygen to the ocean and lower water levels um, as they are warmer. You're going to restrict where the fish are, um, and then you're going to change the internal phosphorus loading and other nutrient um, and I don't like the way the lake nutrients are supposed to work, and I don't care right now. Uh, we want to keep doing what we're doing. So I think it's really, really important to stay, uh, stay vigilant on that piece. Um, so I just really want to just highlight again um, how important it is for us to do, keep doing what you're doing. 79 years is fantastic. Um, I wish you um, just keep your organization going and growing. Um, it's great to hear your numbers. It's uh, these kinds, this kind of effort that is able to support the $21 million um, angler economy that Oneida Lake supports alone. New York State's largest inland lake supports a $21 million angler uh, economy right here. That's it. Um, and then Lake Erie only has 10,000 more angler days a year than Oneida Lake as the third most fished lake um, in, in New York State. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. Um, so as a, I really like it more, you know, which is a science that fits dearly, which is a big pun. Um, so I do my best, my favorite pun. So it's all of us um, schooling together for Oneida Lake's success, because that's my favorite image, is all the fish swimming together to go eat that bigger fish. And that's us spreading um, all the things we need to do to take care of this incredible water body that we get the honor to steward. So thank you guys very much. I can answer some questions. I'm sure. Okay. A lot more questions, Matt. We answer a lot of questions about more uh, access and stuff like that. Um, in the last five years, I'll say more sports and stuff. So, anyways, one thing that's increased in the last 30 years, even though the ice, we don't have much ice, ice fishing is very popular when there is safe ice. And, yeah. they, and they come in, there's a lot more people fishing up, they get a lot out of it. Uh, Maybe they don't have as much money, but they can't, they can't afford a forty thousand dollar boat that they can have here for a thousand bucks. So they need more access. And you know, when you go in the Lewis Point and it's in a truck, you know, there's no to park. They park along the, some of the spots where people have property. And when you get there five in the morning, just to get a parking spot to get out there, and it's kind of, and that's not during the week. So uh, anyway. There absolutely needs some more spots around the lake for ice fishermen. And I and just, I, I'm even an advocate for a lot of them. Yeah. You know, that's if we got more ice. No, I think that's great. And I think just so you know, the state, um, you know, it's really important that open space plan is yeah. if those ideas are in there, then the state is able to go into that acquisition. And we're Scott for milk because I think you just manage more fishing access points because that's his favorite thing. Yeah, um, yeah. which is really important. Yes. Yeah, and they say you know, you get those little spots to park for ice fishing. They could double with on a fall, maybe they could walk down and do some wading along the, the lake there and wade or these spots. So I know you can keep them off. But anyways, that's enough. Thank you. Is there anything else? Okay. Excellent. Thank you very much. Appreciate the encouragement for the future and thank you very much for the presentation. Eric, did you take my program? Not sure I did. I'm sorry.
Next presenter has been no stranger to this organization. As a matter of fact, he returned from Albany to be up here with us this evening. Jim Farquhar is the New York State DEC Bureau Chief Wildlife Division. Jim, the podium is yours. And this topic will be Cormorant again. And that's been an ongoing issue with us ever since they showed up here on 908. And we do need the New York State DEC effort every year to control for to, there for damage control. There you go, Jim. Welcome. Thank you, Thank you Kelly. Um, before I get started, I, I do want to acknowledge a couple of people. One, uh, you know, Tony gave a presentation earlier. Tony always kind of helped us look at the back and forth and stick and pull together. So I think some sense of what's going on in terms of foreign land security. I'll speak to that a little bit, but uh, tonight um, as well. And Jim Emmer, in the community center, uh, always provides a uh, really detailed analysis of the work that they've done on the land this year. And it was always great about getting that information out here. So we got to present it. Uh, so um, I guess we'll go forward. So I just want to touch base on the statewide program just a little bit. I do this every year. Uh, these slides don't change a lot, but I just I guess I faded these in. Uh, last year, I talked about consolidating our, our two permits into one. We did that last year. Uh, we got a standalone permit last year that enabled to take a uh, combined date of 3,500 birds and 7,000 nests. When we started to see, uh, go ahead. When we started to see some very, very serious problems that are fished out of sites in Long Lake, Ontario last year. Year before 2022, we had pretty good problems. The West gave contracts with us and managed to those sites for us. Uh, they took, I think, 170 birds in 2022, along with 18,000 birds. Last year, pretty quickly, there were about over the 200 we allocated, a bit more. They killed 370 birds. And um, let's see. Okay, but yeah, I got a little ahead of myself. Uh, but that's okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. So because of that concern at the time, I talked to the Fish and Wildlife Service, and they were very, very good about uh, very, very quickly upping our permit with the proper action of Cedar Commons, which we didn't. Uh, but now we have a permit that, that uh, authorizes the state 4,500 birds at the authorized sites and 8,500 nests. So the good news about that is it probably exceeds anything that we need to do. So I think we're in really good shape for land management when and where we can and when we can. Renewal this year will be the same. So in 2024, uh, as I've said before, our take is limited to the sites uh, listed on the permit. Um, it's fish stocking locations. I think there's a lot of more on Lake Ontario. Is it not? You know, Justin? No, I don't have a comment. He just knows how to fish. Um, he's the really, he's folks who are really good at it. Um, we've got fish stocking sites. Uh, we've got a number of islands. Our hatcheries are included in that. Um, and then we've got our island sites on the St. Lawrence River, the eastern base of the Lake Ontario, uh, all along the Niagara, Lake Erie, uh, some on Lake Champlain, and of course we've got some authorization on the Lake Ontario. Last, I just want to mention, and this is really what most of the uh, work that gets done up here is down there, we've got a scientific collection permit on Ida Lake that authorizes to take up to 300 birds annually to do the diet study that they do. And I'll talk about that in a minute too. Thanks. So just to tell you what we did last year, uh, overall across the state, we took about 2,500, 2,600 cormorants, which were destroyed about 6,700 nests, primarily those in the Eastern Basin. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, 370 of that total uh, were those fish stocking sites by USDA. But look at the numbers, about 25,000 birds cased. Now those were repeat offenders, but literally they had thousands of birds chowing down on those fish. As they come on the sites. Nice thing about those are is uh, it's a short term problem. Uh, fish are released near shore, water is still kind of cool, there's a great surface, they're vulnerable for a week, two weeks, three weeks, and then that problem kind of goes away. But very, very intensive management for a short period of time. Uh, just to break it down a little bit, we killed a few birds on the St. Lawrence River, uh, protecting common turn sites. Uh, the Eastern Basin, really dual purpose, is maintaining uh, space for. Uh, 
at this other birds, uh, but also is toward the quality of fishery. Uh, Lake Erie, Niagara is probably the most sensitive sites, uh, island erosion um, and uh, sensitive species. Uh, and Lake Champlain is much more sensitive species. So really our two key places for fisheries protection uh, where we can articulate our own lake and then these two basin lake So let's get to Oneida Lake just uh, very, very briefly. Um, there's just a summary in that table of the birds taken for diet analysis over the course of the summer. Try to spread that out because diets do change over the course of the year. Uh, region 6 wildlife and 7 fisheries kind of conduct this work. Uh, they took 17 count trips and that includes some hazing and some collection birds over the course of the spring into the fall. Uh, 231 birds collected. For whatever reasons, 238 of the diet study. So pretty, pretty similar to how we think last year is about 223 or 225 birds per diet study. So it's a good number to look at. Uh, as was the case last year, Goby were the most prominent uh, fish in the diet. Yellow perch by far and away accounted for most of the weight uh, because of the bigger fish. So diet perch very important for the diet. Um, just by comparison to other years, the average count per trip was about 415 this year. That was up just a little bit from last year, I think 390, 395, 385. Um, and the peak count was 965, which was actually down a little bit from last year. So we're holding our own up there, I guess, is, is the bottom line. With the energy we're putting in there, not making great gains on getting the numbers down, but we're not losing ground. So I guess that's the great take home message tonight. Next slide. And just to portray that graphically, you can kind of see the uptick just a little bit in the, uh, in the per trip this year, but still well below uh, that 2017, 2018, 2019. Those were the years where we lost permanent management or had very limited, and we still actually suffered a little bit for it. One thing I like to point out is the one on the right. Um, it's not uniform numbers over the course of the year, right? In the spring through the summer, we've actually got relatively low permanent numbers on the lake. Uh, you can see the averages, and you can see last year, which kind of followed that pattern. It's really a relatively short time in about mid August when birds start migrating that we see those numbers. And that's where we put the most energy in. Next slide. I'll speak to that. So, for 2024, um, they're renewing the permit. Uh, we'll still be doing diet studies. I'll collect up to 300 again as we come in the past. Continue, to continue that data set so that we can look at that information. Um, we'll start out um, while the numbers are down uh, with one trip a week, monitor those birds, save them a little bit, flex the birds. Uh, we'll ramp it up a little bit as, uh, as cormorants start to show up, uh, and um, even a little bit more as we get to September when we see some really high numbers. Um, and we'll do one count a week during the uh, first three weeks of October. Um, I'll know, and Jim provided this, if bird numbers remain high, uh, if they, uh, a sport fish uh, remain a significant component of the diet, uh, we'll keep that effort going uh, probably out to the summer. And hopefully, in this cooler weather, ice, uh, the hormones will leave and we pull back. So, how are we doing overall? It's not like I can finish with this. And this slide just did change a little bit because I, I said holding our home, but this year I actually added four games in terms of our fish habitat and what are their objectives. And I say that because last year we're actually able to, uh, we actually took fewer birds in a few sites than we had before. I think we may be getting ahead of birds out of the Niagara just a little bit. Uh, two years ago, Justin and his group took something like 2,200 birds off of our island sites there. Last year was about 1,300. Uh, there was another site though, so we'll see. Um, we put a little more energy into the Eastern Basin of Lake Ontario. I think we're starting to get ahead of that again after those losses we had. We can just get there next year. Uh, but we do still probably see some impacts for that increase that we had about five years ago, five, six years ago. So we're kind of watching that. I think we're starting to get ahead of a few places. Still have some significant challenges. Probably the most important one right now, I would say, is. Uh, fish stocking sites, uh, we're just seeing tremendous 
the birds are migrating at the time because of water temperatures. The birds are migrating at the time of migrate. Water temperatures will release the fish when the birds are showing up. And cormorants are really good about telling their friends and neighbors to uh, go to those locations. So uh, we'll watch that. They're out there starting at work now. Um, we'll see what happens. Hopefully, we'll get a little better this year. Uh, and last, on the night of lake, I'm going to say, talk to Tony. But if you look at his report, I think it's still a draft right now. Uh, what Tony offers right now, I think, if I don't get this wrong, I do, uh, is the cormorants probably are still not necessarily a huge issue um, that we can protect of your meditative fishery. There's other things going on. The cormorants probably we still got them underneath that sweet spot where, uh, or, or that bad spot, I should say, where, where we saw those the past years ago. Uh, that's, I guess, the good news. Bad news, maybe, is that we're not really getting ahead of them with the holes in our hands. So, uh, I think we're doing okay. And we'll keep putting the effort in, and hopefully, we'll be able to continue to do it. Yeah? Good question. Yeah. Okay. Excuse what's going on with the testing? No. I don't think you would know better. I don't think we had any testing last year. Um, no, any, there wasn't any successful testing? I don't think there's any successful testing. So there is um, an effort to control that. I think there still is, I think, uh, at least on a couple of islands, there's some effort. We do have, our firm does cover that, so we do start to see significant testing. Probably for the end of it. Um, we haven't been able to do that. If we had any, it was very small. Yeah, quick one for you. If the gobies are exploding on the lake, the cormorants prefer the gobies. And they tell their friends, can we expect a bigger population to start moving to that lake because of the abundance of the gobies? You know, I, that's, it's a good question. Um, you know, cormorants are opportunistic, right? They take whatever is most readily available. Um, gobies are there in numbers, that's what they're going to get. Uh, I don't know if you're going to see big numbers. There's only a few. You might see a few more um, non breeding sub adults taken out of the lake for the, the summer, and that could be some of what we're seeing. Um, there's limited nesting sites, and there's controlled nesting probably with the hazing that goes on. Probably not seeing huge influxes, but they always surprise us. But the food picks up, and you think they look more of them start using the lake, right? They might, you know, they've got gobies in other systems too. Um, and we're not seeing those numbers necessary to spike the big salad. So, um, are you seeing any uh, correlation between the fall, particularly the fall hazing effort, and common turn nesting success the following spring? Between the fall migration? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, preserving those island sites and stopping them from taking such a beating in the fall, and does that translate into? Increased common turn nest success in the spring. I don't. I don't think we've actually seen that. I think you know the biggest issue for common turns on that lake in particular is uh, you've got low islands. Um, in some cases, they probably need some help. There's some efforts underway to look at restoring. I think it's a uh, little. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to do some kind of a restoration effort to get that sort of hardened, raised. Uh, more suitable for common terms. If that does take shape, and it might, there's a lot of interest in doing that. Cormorants are going to be a factor then because we know they'll show up as well. So uh, there could be some energy to be used there. Good. But I don't think we see a correlation between fall cormorant presence and uh, spring. It, it, it just that's just a visual observation that the last two years, in particular, a combination of weather. And you know the birds are opportunistic in the other direction, where when you guys go out and haze them really hard, they roost overnight in different places than customary. And the, the damage that fall population can do to the vegetation in those new places is uh, would surprise a lot of people here. Yeah, yeah. Cormorants are uh, cormorants are really good at destroying vegetation. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> Smaller body of water that circle around you know, the surround the night lake and stuff. Now they have they have some smaller numbers of cormorants. Did you keep a, a count on them at all or check up check them? Um, only when we hear about them. Um, 
typically, we're not paying a lot of attention in the, in the wild, the wildlife side of things. We're not paying a lot of attention to feathers, half a dozen programs on such and such a level, two lakes to do, black lake plantation. We pay more attention when we get uh, calls about the potential nesting. We do want to try to track that. Uh, and this year, just uh, because the Fish and Wildlife Service had an interest in it across uh, all four flyways, we're actually engaged in trying to get together a sort of national account for assessment format numbers this year. I don't know if we'll pull it off, but we always get pretty good data on data on our nesting sites. Generally, no we're, we're, we're birds nesting. One more question, if there is one. Jim, okay. yeah, uh, I see that some ant nasal birds, I think they're called. Have you been reported or seen elsewhere? Um, I, in more yeah, I don't think anyone feels that they're like, you know, with climate change. I don't think that anyone feels that they've moved up like that far. Uh, but I think it was last year there was a report of something like 30 around or something. It was an eye opening number, I guess. I think it was two locations where they were seen, but I think the, the guess is they probably sort of. Got blown up in a, a something or something and ended up here. They kind of disappeared. We don't expect them back. Maybe, maybe 50 years ago. Jim, what, what bird did you just refer to? What's what that you're speaking about? Anhangus. Uh, they're a southern bird. They look a lot like cormorants. Um, they're kind of a cool bird, a little bit smaller. Thank you, Thank you very much, Great job for us. Okay, a couple more items on the agenda. Uh, an update from last year's presentation of the nine element plan, and uh, Aaron McKee is here to do that for us. After that, we will follow it with the OLA Conservationist of the Year Award, and then we will be doing the uh, usual door prize drawings. Thank you for coming again, Aaron. Thanks a lot for having me, uh, everybody. Thanks for coming in, Matt. And, uh, thanks, for, thanks for everybody for that. Um, a lot of what we're going to talk about tonight related to the nine element watershed plan is a little bit repetitious from last year. I apologize, but it's a complicated thing. There are a lot of moving parts. Uh, it kind of bears repeating. But uh, Derek and Tony did some of the lifting for me. In terms of talking about some of the factors influencing the overall heart rate rate. So maybe we can uh, speed through some of this. So uh take it away. Up. So uh I'm with the Central New York Regional Planning and Development Board. I just like to explain that because it's kind of an obscure agency, it's from 1966. Uh it's the it was established by Geo Group Portland, Madison, Onondaga, and Sweetwater counties, and they provide a variety of services, including economic development and others kind of support the municipalities. I'm the manager of the environmental program, which really is all about water quality. So, on this project, our project team is led by Madison County, the planning department there, uh, some, some the regional planning development board and set. And we're also working hand in hand with the Department of State, which is providing a lot of the funding for this activity. And uh, the Department of Environmental Conservation is critically important. Ultimately, the plan, the ultimate plan, is to get approval from the DC at the end of the process. And once we have that in hand, it uh, it boosts a score for grant applications for projects in the watershed. So that's part of the idea of this project: is to develop a plan where we coordinate efforts across a very large watershed with a lot of municipalities. Uh, and then everybody in that watershed can reference the plan and basically, you know, put their projects in it and use the plan to get grant monies to do great water quality projects all across the watershed. Uh, another part of this, one of the things that makes a nine element plan a little bit different as a plan for projects uh, is that it involves a lot of digital modeling. So we are very lucky to have a great modeling team. We are working with Cornell University uh, and also Upstate Freshwater Institute, which is one of the uh, firms in town that really knows Central New York and Central New York water bodies. And, and of course, the you know, biological field station at Chapels and Clark has you know, a wealth of data that we're drawing on. 
We're also working with a very large watershed advisory committee. You know, we've referenced that committee a few times. It's made up of about 25 different agencies, entities, municipalities, county planning offices, and so on, conservation districts. A lot of people have been very generous with their time coming together, meeting over the past year and a half to talk about this planning process. I always like to clarify what a watershed is. I did this presentation to my wife's office, and those folks uh, really were blown away. They did not, they see the signs all the time for the cross means this watershed, the cross out of that watershed there. They don't really know what it means. It just means all of the land that drains to a given water body. So, I believe the next map, oh yeah, so here you go. So you get a sense, you know, you don't always have a good sense of how large the watershed for a water body is. Cases of it's really big. The, uh, the Onetomy watershed is roughly the size of Rhode Island. Uh, takes in 69 municipalities and, uh, yeah, 69 municipalities and small, uh, two different amounts of six counties. So no individual municipality really is like in charge of the Onetomy watershed. It takes a planning effort like this to get everybody together and build consensus and, and come up with some ideas on. What's the best way forward? How do we want to measure the overall health of the watershed? How do we want to measure the health of the lake in this context of watershed planning? So that's that's kind of what we're, what we're doing here. Um, so what what we're doing is called a nine element plan, which within a framework defined by the uh, EPA. In this case, if this all sounds familiar, it's because my office did a very similar plan, a watershed plan for the Nile watershed in 2004. And we're building on that. And so we're asking a lot of the same questions. How is the lake doing? What's the connection between the lake's water quality and the whole watershed and the wall of the things that are running off of the land into the lake? Um, but as I said, in this case, one of the differences is we're using models. We're using modeling to try to figure out a path. And a big part of it, of course, with the planning effort is public input. So I've got a survey that's online where we're asking for your input with issues with the watershed, and I've got a table right out there that has a QR code. So if you're interested in providing your input on watershed, watershed issues, please take a minute and, uh, and provide your input. Uh, yeah. Okay, so this is. Yeah, I'm gonna fix it Sorry, Aaron. <laughs> hey, one of my initiatives as president next year, you'll have a clicker of your own. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, great. Well, <laughs> thank, thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is just to give you an idea of what is the breakdown, what names do we have across this whole big gigantic watershed? Uh, the good news for the United Lake watershed is that it's a lot of it is relatively unknown. So, we've got 51% of the whole watershed is like what you might call a forest or shrub scrub, you know, it's not developed land. And that 15% of wetland is critically important. So those wetlands serve as filters for uh, all the stormwater. Before it gets to the lake, it's going to be dropping off sediment and nutrients into the wetlands before it gets into uh, the lake. Uh, and a lot of that, 24% of agriculture is on the south side. Um, important as we start to talk about tributaries, you know, like uh, the, the Waterhouse Creek, Limestone Creek, or the Mega Creek, all those major tributaries on the south side of the lake. That's probably where we're going to focus a lot of the effort as we move forward. All right, so one of the things that has not probably come up in the different conversations is like, how do we talk about land? What's the status of the lake from the perspective of watershed planning? When Lake scientists know about this stuff, talk about it, they'll lump lakes into three categories. The very clear lakes that are not very productive, they don't have a lot of energy, they're called oligotrophic. On the other end of the spectrum, lakes that are very productive, uh, lots of algae, they're called eutrophic. Hit one more, I can do a little circle for where Onetta Lake is, which is right in the middle, which is called mesotrophic. A very good place for a lake to be when you want to have a lot of fish, you don't want to have too much algae. It's a very nice balance of nutrients uh, and productivity without kind of going overboard and Derek kind of alluded to this. Where a lake is is kind of where we want it to be to some degree. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> so the key ingredient in trying to kind of sort out how the link is doing, you would think we're, we're focusing on a pollutant, and you would think when you hear the word pollutant, you think of mercury or peat moss or one of these other chemicals that you just don't have in the link. The thing that we really focus on is phosphorus because phosphorus is the nutrient that's critical to life, but it's also not as abundant as some of the things are. Nitrogen, also critical to life, but far more abundant than phosphorus. Phosphorus kind of gets doled out by nature, you know, in small amounts, sort of, as a way of speaking. Um, so if you can control the amount of phosphorus coming into the lake, you have a shot at staying right there on that line between mesotrophic and eutrophic. Not too productive, but still productive enough to support a healthy fishery. So actually, we're still right there, which is something. Uh, where the, phosph the phosphorus level in the 1970s and 1980s traditionally much higher than it is today. Then there was legislation to make sure that there wasn't phosphorus in the churches, so there were phosphorus inputs and, and phosphorus coming from those like treatment plants to plant with. So overall, phosphorus levels in the lake dropped significantly. Now, where we've been for the past few years is right around that. That number is 20, and this is 20 parts per billion or 20 micrograms. That's a number that the Medical Association said many years ago. That's where we like to have it. We prefer that the, we prefer that the phosphorus level in the lake not go below that. And DEC likes to say, well, 20 micrograms, that's a good number. That's kind of the upper level of where we want to be to not slide into a neutrophic lake that's too, that's got too much power, that's too productive. So we like this number of 20. And as you can see, uh, over the past couple of years, total phosphorus in the lake has been right in that number. So I'm done. That was it. Good job. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Sorry. So, right, the, the current phosphorus level is it, it's doing well. You might ask yourself, why do we have a new plan if it's doing great? But the next slide goes back to what we already talked about, which is climate change. So, with climate change, we can see, you know, obviously, we've already seen a new one. We've seen a reduction in our study. Um, and the next slide is a little bit about precipitation. But this, this kind of shows a mild increase in precipitation, but what it, it doesn't show which something that's anticipated more severe. So if you're getting two inches of rain a day, that's a huge amount of rain relative to the amount of rain per year. If you get more and more two inch a day events, that leads to much more phosphorus, much more sediment being washed into the lake. That, yes, that puts up on the back. This is a little, the little blue box there kind of shows question marks. The amount of phosphorus in the lake is likely to bump back as a result of climate change. Our modeling of the lake and of the watershed will give us a better idea. It's not quite done yet in the next couple of months that model will get there to tell us what we, had, what we anticipated that increase in overall phosphorus inputs to the lake to be a result of climate change. And that kind of turns into almost like a magic number. That's what we would be looking to offset through best management practices, through all of the things you can do to hold sediment and nutrients on the landscape to the extent possible. Yeah, yeah, so actually, we got to do some things here. Yeah, so there's all different kinds of best management practices. Every, all you can take all shapes and sizes, could be educational practices, but more often than things that are done on the landscape, they're, they're things that are done uh, with the sort of more conservation districts or plant health and extension. Well, actually, that isn't the one more start to see. Yeah, so some examples of best management practices. So after the cash crop is harvested on the, on the row crop field, plant a cover crop to make sure that through the winter months the soil is held in place by the roots of some cover crop. It's very popular with farmers. They, hold, they, they like to hold their soil and nutrients on the landscape as much as possible, and it benefits the water quality. Livestock inclusion, we keep, we keep livestock from going to streams and doing stream banks. Uh, 
holes in the way. There's, there's zillions of these things. EMPs, there's whole books of them. They take all different kinds of uh, forms. And, and they can all be used to improve water quality. So part of the planning process, obviously, is trying to figure out, okay, which set of EMPs is going to be most effective in reducing that climate change increase as a result. Climate change is a cost risk. Who implements these EMPs? The soil and water conservation districts are really big ones here. Uh, obviously, we work with six different counties. So they, they take the lead a lot of the time in implementing these EMPs and working with farmers. But it's a whole team. Uh, the towns and villages are also key in this. Zone uh, code, site plan review, you know, making sure that development doesn't happen in the floodplain, it's not happening too close to tributaries. Uh, health departments talking about. Subject tank uh, inspection programs, uh, subject tank pump out subsidies, uh, which are used in other watersheds, maybe coming to parts of the United watershed. Uh, so there's just a lot of different ways to go. And what we're looking at right now is developing uh, scenarios of these BMPs and plugging them into the watershed model. And yeah, so now we get into a little bit about the water model. Itself, I don't relate with this, um, but there are these models can simulate the conditions across the watershed, and we're fortunate to have a second model that actually will then take that and tell us how the lake will respond to different changes in the watershed. So we're really optimistic as we move forward here, we can kind of get a good sense of what combination of EMPs we want to put to um, keep the lake in the kind of condition it's in. Um, so, just a sense of like, you know, what, what's the goal here? The idea again is to try to figure out there's a lot of BMPs that we use all across the landscape. Can we do more? What would be most effective? Um, the watershed model can simulate some, some future conditions. So, if we add a ton of cover cover plants, we took all of the wood crop, crop acreage in the watershed and we were able to put uh, cover crops in 20%. Of those row crops, what would that do? Would that be enough to offset our climate change increase? Uh, if we use more, if we did stream and stabilization projects, that's how we could get more money. Let's do all the stream and stabilization projects that they're going to for you know, some nutrient sediment inputs. Uh, and then other agricultural communities, the soil water conservation districts uh, all across the watershed are coming up with this. So they now have a list of uh, projects that have about a million dollars in ideas, all waiting for funding uh, that, you know, that can be spread out across this watershed. Um, and we'll start with like preparing some buffer plants and vegetation between, say, a parking lot and uh, the tributaries that are going to absorb sediment and runoff. So let's look at where we. Working towards it's more going to develop a plan, an adaptive management plan, uh, a, a set of projects that we can implement short term, mid term, long term projects. Uh, but we want to do it in such a way that we can kind of continue to measure the lake's health and make adjustments as we're going along. We would refresh the, this plan. I should say the, the schedule here is to be done about certainly a year from now. So, a year from now, this whole plan should be wrapped up. Um, and then to continue to monitor and on a 10 year cycle, take a look at it, see how we're doing. We need to make adjustments uh, in our goals, we need to make adjustments in our compliance. So that is really, I mean, so that's, that's a link to the uh, survey of that refinement water that I took. So that is kind of the real short version of that. Does anybody have any questions? I don't have an update with the town piece that was just trying to do a water, uh, a sewer system to replace the septic tanks. Yeah. I don't have an update on that, unfortunately, but I know that the town is looking for our images. Yeah, that'll be that'll be a key 
Um, I, I have to say, I chaired the, the conservationist uh, award committee for nine years, I think. And last year was the first time that we've had just a, a single non meeting come up from the first name on the, on the docket to pull the committee on the end. That's our guy. Um, you know, we saw him as somebody who fits the criteria with this award at least three ways. He has a huge impact on the major issues of the day. Um, he's given a lifetime of service to his lake and his community. He's still going strong. And John embodies the kind of humility and certain leadership that we as a society can do better to recognize more often. Um, so we were all set to recognize John, then Tony pulled his hijinks on me, um, and so uh, that happened. Uh, but then, as some of you may know, in the, the summer of last year, we had some turnover on the board of the United Lake Association, and we needed to turn to somebody who was a, a past president who had a steady hand. Right, to help guide the United Lake Association through those waters. And not only did John guide the ship ably, um, he sailed through your great accomplishments in his somewhat unexpected term as president. Um, he set the highest possible standard for me and for any other future president of the United Lake Association and put on an absolute showcase of leadership and modeling a way to show all of us how to care about this lake that we all love so much. Um, I can tell you as a volunteer who's had the great honor and privilege to work with John, um, we as a board have never been more engaged or more energized uh, than as we have been under his leadership this past year. So, John, thank you for that. Um, one advantage of having the waiting years, I had some time to ask other people what they thought of John. Um, some of those comments were suitable for public consumption. Um, <laughs> I, I quote, uh, John is beloved by all the people who ever worked with him. He did a lot of work that had a great impact that still makes a difference in our organization today. He touched everything from the budgets, professional development, to working with people on the front lines. John is a great professional and an even better person. And that's from uh, Greg Santoro uh, in the City Apple School District, who Greg and John worked together for decades during John's career as an educator. Um, which culminated in uh, a role as skinny analyst curriculum coordinator principal. Um, I can tell you that John is a guy who, I, anybody here work in public schools, it's not the easiest environment sometimes in which to get things done. And John and his career mastered the fine art of art for the kids of getting shit done. Um, and has brought that to a United Lake Association at high volume and high impact. Um, another person who commented on John's impact in our community here said, and I quote, he's Mr. Steady. He's been here longer than anyone can remember, and he gets so many things done on his own that I can't imagine what we do without him. He's a backbone guy who goes out of his way to help others, and he never asks for any recognition. And that comes from Bob Longo, who's the Commodore of Fleet, uh, Hobie Fleet 204 sailing organization on the South Shore. Um, Bob wanted the United Lake Association members to know that John not only makes a difference to his fellow sailors, but the people from all walks of life across our United Lake community. And that we should take a moment to really recognize the to a board. Um, everything John does with the fleet and his other volunteer activities, he brings that knowledge and expertise and that network of contacts right back to the United Lake Association and it puts it work to us. Um, the final comment, quote, I don't think the United Lake would be anywhere near as well off right now without him. We've had huge opportunities and issues to deal with, and John has great instincts for getting things done. Literally, no one has stepped up more or been more of an inspiration to people all around the United Lake. John's volunteer efforts really do make a difference on issues like New York State's Indian Affairs, watershed conservation, and sound water level policy and practice. That last quote is from the nomination that was given to the OLA Conservation Steer Award Committee. Um, it, it still rings true, uh, even more so after the year that it's been. And as a group, I, I think I speak for all the board when I say we've been absolutely wild by the example that John has set for us and his ability to get important things done in a hurry, um, but without breaking things, right? Without breaking relationships and, and by respecting the way the board and the association go about their business. Um, he's done a great job of presiding over the OLA's focus on issues where we can really have a meaningful impact of program control of law enforcement. And he's led our, our 
in ventures in new areas like the United League Association Scholarship, which began as the German idea and now is an entirely stood up philanthropy program that John continues to go out and beat the street and uh, garner additional funds to support uh, students who wish to further their education with a focus on United League conservation. Um, in his spare time, uh, he's filled huge shoes as editor of our Indians of Bullet, which I hope desperately that he will continue to do. Um, he secured the biggest grant in the history, of the 79 year history of the United Lake Association. Um, and he's guided us through the period that we're in right now. You know, these are the salvage of the United Lake Association with a strong membership, growing membership, and greater number of engagement than ever. So, in the spirit of using this award to inspire all of us who care about an idea, um, it's finally my distinct honor and privilege to announce that the winner of the 2020, I'm sorry, the 2024 Conservationist of the Year Award is President John Harlan. John? Humble, deeply thankful for the kind words from Matt, and certainly very thankful for the entire team of the LLA board and our membership who supported me uh, through all this. So I can assure you, you know, I pledge to you I'll continue to work for the association in any capacity when need be, but pleased also to turn things over to Matt. So thank you very much. <laughs> I have never seen anyone handle a meeting gavel as well as we can. We have not had a single monthly meeting that didn't end exactly on time and never over time. And I appreciate that. It's, it's time for the giveaways. And of course, the, the two big prizes for this evening are the uh, action camera that is both good in the water and above the water, and the uh, kayak. So those will be the last two drawings. In the meantime, we have these beautiful bird hoses here, and we have uh, many door prizes from vendors that have been purchased things from, and they are most generous in giving us extra product for the amount of money that we spent. So I'd like to recognize those. Uh, Wayside Outfitters, Mickey's Bait Tackle, Mike's Bait and Tackle and Brewerman, Central New York Wildflowers, Water Conservation District, Anadaga County, Mark Berger, with the uh, bird houses as well. And I think I've covered them all. Oh yes, whole U.S. Absolutely, the uh, four gift certificates to Astro. Sun and snow recreation. Who recreation? Sun and snow. Sun, the sun, the snow. Sun and snow. All right, sun and snow recreation. Thank you. Okay, so we need to draw some tickets out of here so I can announce the numbers and see who wins what. Are there any teenagers in the audience or any young children in the audience? I know sometimes all of us get in with a teenager, but I'm looking for great teenagers. You got a couple? Yeah, come on. We'll give you a door prize for your effort for us. You can give us a hand in uh, distributing the door prizes. Hey, George. Uh, uh, young kids, we have five packs, 15 packets of fishing lures and educational uh, brochures for the kids. They're all the other hand out. Okay, wonderful. Oh yeah, yes, we had door prizes. Uh, door prizes came from Brian Hammond, the Hammer Tackle, 
company, and uh, we're going to start with a hat and a t-shirt from his company. 